Hi. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, I'm part of a startup looking to introduce insects as a source of protein in the West, a sustainable one. There's four of us in the team, Aaron, one of them is sitting in the audience, we'll catch him later. Um, and we started this project as um, a graduation project in a course called Innovation Design Engineering, which is half at Imperial College where the engineering and science bit go on and uh, the design part at the Royal College of Art. Uh, we were looking at a project that allowed us to look at sustainability in a more kind of commercial and, and systemic way. And we were really interested in food security, mostly because of the numbers you can see here. So uh, 2012, when we started the project, uh, 7 billion people, we needed 20 gigacalories to maintain the world. Um, the, the problem is by 2050, and I mean, we're struggling as is, but we're gonna have 9 billion people at least. And because of a rise in living standards, which is a good thing, we're gonna need a lot more calories proportionally because we're gonna need more protein. So we need alternatives, and basically that's why we got really interested in insects. So insects are incredibly efficient. Um, maybe you've come across some sort of numbers. This has become a bigger topic in the last few years. Um, but basically, if you feed a cow 10 kilograms of grains, it will give you one kilogram of beef. If you give the same amount of feed to a cold-blooded insect, <laughs> it'll give you between six and nine kilograms of meat. And from that meat, um, you're gonna get more protein and less fat and a really kind of good balance of essential fatty acids and other ingredients. So not only is it more efficient, it's actually very nutritious as well. Um, there's a lot of research on this. People have been looking at this for decades. Uh, every time there's like a freak out about where a protein is gonna come from. Um, and they're looking at regulation, at farming, at kind of how to scale it up, what's their chemical composition and so on. And, and then you're like, okay, this all sounds really interesting. I wanna try this. And you, you come across this. <laughs> and um, you go back to like, okay, why should I be doing this? <laughs> And, and basically, here is where we saw a, a huge opportunity for, for design. And uh, mostly because when people see this, this is what they think. And a lot of these things, you know, they're yes or no. Like, do they taste good? Yes or no. But a lot of these are very abstract, kind of intangible topics that can be addressed in more subtle ways. So when we started the project, we first looked at all the things that were yes or no answers. You know, we went to taste them. The flavors are actually great. Uh, they're crunchy, they're not gooey at all. They taste well. We talked to a lot of entomologists, make sure they're actually absolutely safe. So genetically speaking, they're very different from us. So if you wash them and cook them, there's actually a lot less risks of anything happen than we do with our current uh, beef, chicken, or whatever it is we're eating, uh, especially pork. And also the fact that these have been eaten for millennia in, in, in different countries and even in modern cuisine, a lot of cookbooks have been written. So it's, it's, it's less weird than people expect it's gonna be. Um, but basically still the problem is um, how do we generate acceptance in the West and how do we transform people's perceptions? Um, so we started doing a bunch of experiments to see like how far we could push people and where exactly the pain points were when they had to eat insects or when we wanted them to want to eat insects. Uh, and this was actually one of the more telling exper experiments we did um, early on. So we basically did this table with, on one end we had these really abstract dishes made of insects such as crackers or pates and then, you know, kind of moving on to burgers and to risottos and things that you could identify more, all the way to the other end where you had, you know, very visible insects. And we took people through this table and asked them what they would try and why and why not. And kind of when they got here, you know, they'd say things that we kind of expected, like, well, it's staring at me. I don't know if it's alive or dead. I don't think I could do it. Uh, and then on this side, you know, okay, I could probably try that because the form of the insect is destroyed. But where we found the real insight were in some of the things in between 
So <laughs> I, we, we kind of quite like this quote. It's like, those look quite tasty. They look like chicken goujons. And, and basically what this told us is that um, it, it's not necessarily about the insect. It's, it's about food, and it's about that thing that makes you want to eat something, that it, that it just looks like food, like good food, tasting things. And, and that comes from food culture. So we started thinking, like, how do we create a food culture, and, and what does a food culture even mean? Um, basically, what, what tells me that this is a sandwich and I can eat it with two hands and that's acceptable and it can be lunch or dinner um, if I don't have enough time. So we started kind of breaking this apart and thinking, what, what are the elements that we need to create in order to kind of create an artificial culture for insects that could be brought into the West and make this acceptable for us and how we see food? And then once that would be created, how do you introduce that? So how do food cultures travel and become embedded in what we know as food? Um, so we started looking at different examples. And sure enough, like sandwiches and pizza are fairly easy. Uh, but we found a really good one in sushi. Because 30 years ago, like we actually found this travel guide, uh, which was advising, um, I think it was British tourists going to Japan that they should watch out because the Japanese had this very like weird habit of eating raw fish. And it was actually like hygienic to do it if you really wanted to, but you didn't have to. So you're like, okay, <laughs> this is probably what's going on with insects. How did they manage to adapt it to what we do and why was that a success? Um, so looking at that timeline and how that was introduced, we started thinking about this idea that food culture changes and basically you need something right now that people can accept right now, but then every year you need to push it a little bit more until you're at a point where people will just accept it, you know, in a supermarket or in a more casual way. And that drove us to our strategy. So we became quite interested in this idea of the trend adoption curves and how, you know, uh, there's a certain pattern into how things get adopted. Uh, and in this case for food, we said, okay, well, you start with the adventurer, which is what we see as the early adopter. And that's someone that's after, you know, the new exciting thing, and they're gonna probably try insects in a festival when they're drunk, and it'll be fun, and that'll be it. So that's, you know, a way to start. And then you can move on to the foodie, which is gonna be looking for the experience, and they're gonna be looking for something really special, and the flavors, and, and the whole experience all together. Uh, and that's probably going to be something that, you know, you'll do once every few weeks. It's more of a restaurant thing. But then that will allow you to get people familiar with the idea that insects are good food. And you'll be able to move into people that are doing this for ethical nutrition reasons. And these are the people that are going to start having this as a lunch or as a more regular thing. And then later on, down the line, that'll eventually reach the people that will do it for the convenience, so essentially the meat and two veg guy. Um, so if we go back to food culture, like how do you create a food culture and how can we do it? And that's when we started thinking of brand and, and essentially how a brand is a culture and, and what kind of culture we can create around insects. So we can't tell people, you know, insects are filet mignon because clearly they aren't. But there are things that insects are that might not be the first thing that come to mind when you see them as something you have to eat, but that definitely exist in the kind of collective unconscious, such as the fact that they're natural, they're playful, they're futuristic. And we can, we can take on those things to create something that reminds us more of spring and freshness and butterflies and ladybirds and all the good things, and then we don't have to think about all the other things that aren't necessarily the right associations. So with this, we created our brand. Um, we, we decided on the name Ento, uh, Entomos is insect in Greek, so that's where words like entomologist or entomophagy come from. We focused on, on fresh colors. We kind of wanted to take an Asian-Japanese um, subtext to the brand to infuse this idea of control and cleanliness and new foods. And we developed patterns where people could kind of clearly see that the food was made of insects but wouldn't necessarily see the insect in its m most visual form. You know, it, it, it's a little bit of that cute insect idea. Um, and then we started looking at food typology, and we decided to work on creating 
foods that were geometric so that that would kind of give people this trust in the fact that someone <coughs> knows what they're doing and this has been thought through and it's controlled, but at the same time that it's a new food, so you can't 100% recognize it as something else and that makes you curious. And we also created tools and kind of thought about rituals that would allow people to feel like this already exists, that it's a real thing and that they can trust it. Um, and then we had to think about flavors. So we, we ate a lot of insects. <laughs> we still do eat a lot of insects. Um, and the thing is they have new flavors. They're, they're subtle, like people think that, you know, it's this big taboo and, you know, the, the flavors are gonna be unrecognizable, but they're actually quite familiar. They're just a little bit different from what we know. So in order to combine them and create good color, uh, flavor combinations, we started using this website called Molecular Food Pairings. Uh, which is related to this thing Heston Blumenthal does with understanding the structure of food and what goes together based on their molecular structure. Uh, insects haven't been analyzed for that yet. I think someone's working on it now. But at the time, it was more like we taste caterpillars and would be like they taste a bit like pistachios, so what do pistachios go with? And then we'd use that. <laughs> All right. Um, so <laughs> we use that to create a database of flavors. Uh, and then we worked together with chefs to bring these into recipes. Um, and, and that's how we created this. So this is like the image that we used essentially for a final exam at the time. And it was this idea of how do we start with shared experiences that are fun for people that are willing to, you know, kind of taste this in a festival or a one-off with friends. Then moving on to, you know, creating tools and experiences. And that's where we brought in this idea of a cube, something that feels like meat. And then moving on to what we could potentially serve if this became more like fast food and a healthy lunch, uh, on the ethical nutrition side. Uh, and then moving on to initial supermarket products, by which we did things like croquettes or pâtés, or, or things that people already understood as food, so that they would kind of dare to buy them in a shop and use them in a familiar way. Uh, and then, and then from that, kind of just pushing the envelope, and that was a bit of a statement piece, but, but how do we then get people to actually, you know, just, just buy the frozen insects at a supermarket and put them in their bolognese at home? Um, right, so this was 2012, and we, we kept working at it, we graduated, we got a lot of attention. I think it, it was a really nice thing to, to be able to put design onto this idea because, um, Basically, so many scientists had been working on this, and it, it kind of hadn't been given like, like a visual identity or something that people could look and say, oh, I want to try that. And so when that happened, people started kind of getting in touch, and opportunities started happening, and, and we just kept going with it. So this is an example of an event we did, um, actually, with protein and Grey Goose Vodka. Uh, where we did a pop-up restaurant for three days and we collaborated with a catering company to develop a five-course menu. And um, we made a point of wanting to charge for it because for us that was the moment of like, should, should we turn this into a business? Is this what we want to do? And the ticket sold out in two weeks and we got such a great response. And it's this thing like, you work on something as a designer and you kind of put crazy ideas out there. But, but then there's moments where, where, where you really see it happening and you see the people interact with it and it works. Um, so after this response, we said, okay, we're going to turn this into a business. And, and that's what we're doing now. So we're collaborating with chefs, doing events, kind of traveling and getting people to try the food and finding suppliers and farms and figuring out how to produce caterpillar pâtés in mass amounts. And we are also working on a Kickstarter campaign to start on February. So if anyone wants to try them. Um, go to our webpage and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.